the key thing that's going on now is we're moving very quickly through the capability ladder steps. And I think there are roughly three things going on now that are going to profoundly change the world very quickly. And when I say very quickly, the cycle is roughly a new model every year to 18 months. The first is basically the, this question of context window. And for non-technical people, the context window is the prompt that you ask. So, you know, study John F. Kennedy or something. Right. But in fact, that context window can have a million words in it. And this year, people are inventing a context window that is infinitely long. Mm. And this is very important because it means that you can take the answer from the system and feed it in and ask it another question. So I, I want a recipe. Let's say I want a recipe to make a drug or something. So I say, what's the first step? And it says, buy these materials. Mm -hmm. So then you say, okay, I have bought these materials. Now what's my next step? And then it says, buy a mixing pan. And then the next step is, how long do I mix it for? You see it's a recipe. That's called chain of thought reasoning. And it generalizes really well. We should be able in five years, for example, to be able to produce a thousand step recipes to solve really important problems in science, in you know, medicine, in material science, climate change, that sort of thing. That's the first one. Second one is agents. And an agent can be understood as a large language model that knows something new or has learned something. So an example would be um, read all of chemistry, learn something about chemistry, have a bunch of hypotheses about chemistry, run some tests in a lab about chemistry, and then add that to your agent. These agents are going to be really powerful, and it's reasonable to expect that agents will be, not only will there be a lot of them, and I mean millions, but they'll be like the equivalent of GitHub for agents. There'll be lots and lots of agents running around and available to you. And the third one, which to me is the most profound, which is already beginning to happen, is text to action. And what that is, is write me a piece of software to do something, right? You just say it. I mean, can you imagine having programmers that actually do what you say you want? Mm -hmm. And it does it 24 hours a day. Mm -hmm. And strangely, these systems are good at running, uh, writing code such as language like Python. You put all that together, and you've got infinite context window, the ability for agents, and then the ability to do this programming. Now, this is very interesting. What then happens? There's a lot of questions here, and now we get into the questions of science fiction. I'm sure the three things I've named are happening because that work is happening now. But at some point, these systems will get powerful enough that you'll be able to take the agents and they'll start to work together, right? So your agent and my agent and her agent and his agent will all combine to solve a new problem. At some point, people believe that these agents will develop their own language. And that's the point when we don't understand what we're doing. You know what we should do? Pull the plug. Literally unplug the computer. So it's really a problem when agents start to communicate in ways and doing things that we as humans do not understand. That's the limit, in my view. And you think again, how, how far off in the future is that? Well, there have been many, many predictions. Uh -huh. Clearly, agents and these things will occur in the next few years. And it won't occur in like, it, there won't be one day where everybody right. says, oh my God. Right. It's more a question of capabilities every month, every six months, and so forth. A reasonable expectation is we'll be in this new world within five years, wow. not 10. And the reason is there's so much money and not, there are also so many ways in which people are trying to accomplish this. You have the big guys, the, the three large so-called frontier models, right. but you have a very large number of players who are programming at one level lower, at much lesser, lower cost, mm -hmm. who are iterating very quickly. Right. Plus, you have a great deal of research. I think there's every reason to think that some version of what I'm saying will occur within five years and maybe sooner. Well, now, so you say pull the plug. So, two questions. So, how do you pull the plug? But even before you pull the plug, if you know you're already in chain of thought reasoning and you're headed to what you fear, don't you need to regulate at some point that it doesn't get there? Or is that beyond the scope of regulation? Well, 
Well, a group of us have been working very closely with the governments in the West, mm -hmm. and we've started talking to the Chinese, which of course is complicated and takes time, uh, about these issues. Mm -hmm. And at the moment, the governments, with the exception of Europe, which is always kind of slightly confused, have been doing the right thing, which is they've set up trust and safety institutes. They're beginning to learn how to measure things and check things. Mm -hmm. And the right approach is for the governments to watch us and make sure we don't get confused on what the goal is, right? So as long as the companies are well-run Western companies with shareholders and lawsuits and all that, mm -hmm. we'll be fine. There's a great deal of concern in these Western companies about liability, doing bad things. Nobody wants to hurt people. They're not, right. They don't wake up in the morning saying, let's hurt somebody. Right. Now, of course, there's the proliferation problem. Yep. But in terms of the core research, the researchers are trying to be honest. Okay, so that's the West. So by saying the West, you're implying that proliferation outside the West is where the danger is. The bad guys are out there somewhere. Well, one of the things that we know, and it's always useful to remind the techno-optimists in my world, there are evil people and they will use your tools to hurt people. My favorite example is that the face recognition stuff was invented not to constrain the Uyghurs. You know, they didn't say, we're going to invent face recognition in order to constrain this, the minority in China called the Uyghurs, yeah. right? But it's happening. Yeah. All technology is dual use. All of these inventions can be misused. And it's important for the inventors to be honest with that. So in open source, which is, for those of you who don't follow it, Open source is where the source code in, in models, the weights, that is the numbers that have been calculated, are released to the public, yeah. those immediately go throughout the world. And who do they go to? They go to China, of course. Mm -hmm. They go to Russia. They go to Iran. Mm -hmm. right? They go to Belarusia. Yeah. They go to North Korea. Yeah. Uh, when I was most recently in China, the vast, essentially all of the work I saw started with open source models from the West, which were then amplified. So it sure looks to me like these leading firms, the ones I'm talking about, the mm -hmm. ones that are putting Ten, you know, a billion, ten billion dollars yeah. eventually into this will be tightly regulated. I worry that the rest will not. You can see, I'll, I'll give you another example. Look at this problem of misinformation. Mm -hmm. I think it's largely unsolvable. And the reason is the code to generate misinformation mm -hmm. is essentially free, right? right. Any, any, you know, person, right? A good person, a bad person has access to them. It doesn't cost anything, and they produce very, very good images. Right. Uh, there are regulatory solutions to that. But the important point is that that cat is out of the bag, or whatever metaphor you want. Mm -hmm. It's important that these more powerful systems, especially as they get closer to general intelligence, mm -hmm. have some limits on proliferation. Mm -hmm. And that problem is not yet solved yet. To follow up on, on your point about the funding, Fei Fei Li at Stanford argues that's the biggest problem, is that there's so much money going into the private sector. And who's their competition to look at what the red lines are or whatever? It's the universities, which don't have a lot of money. Um, so you really trust these companies to be transparent enough to be regulated by government that doesn't know what well, they're talking about. <laughs> Really? The correct answer is always trust but verify. Yeah. And the truth is you should trust and you should also verify. Mm -hmm. And at least in the West, the best way to verify is to use private companies that are set up as verifiers because mm -hmm. they can employ the right people and so forth. Mm -hmm. So in all of our industry conversations, it's pretty clear that the way it will really work is you'll end up with AI checking AI. Mm -hmm. It's too hard. Think about it. Mm -hmm. You build a new model. Yeah. It's been trained on new data. Yeah. You've worked really hard on it. How do you know what it knows? Yeah. Now, by, you can ask it all the previous questions, yeah. but what if it's discovered something completely new and you don't think about it? Right. And the systems can't regurgitate everything they know. You have to ask them chunk by chunk by chunk. Mm -hmm. So it makes perfect sense that an AI would, would be the only way to police that. Mm -hmm. People are working on that. With Feifei's argument, she's completely correct. We have the rich private industry companies, and we have the poor universities who have incredible talent. Right. 
it should be a major national priority in all of the Western countries mm -hmm. to get research funding for the hardware. If you were a um, physicist 50 years ago, mm -hmm. you had to move to where the cyclon cyclotrons were yeah. because they were really hard and expensive. And by the way, they still are really hard and expensive. You need to be near a cyclotron to do your work as a physicist. Yeah. We never had that in software. Yeah. Our stuff was capital cheap, not capital expensive. Right. The arrival of heavy duty training in our industry is a huge economic change. And what's happening is that companies are figuring this out and the really rich companies, I'm thinking of Microsoft and Google as an example, mm -hmm. are planning to spend billions of dollars yeah. because they have the cash, they have big businesses, the money's coming in, right. that's good. Right. Where does the innovation come from? They don't have that kind of hardware and yet they need access to that. Yeah. Um, okay, let's go to China. So, uh, you just, um, you, on Kissinger's last trip to China, you went with him, and he had a discussion with, with Xi Jinping on exactly this set of issues. Your, your, your idea was to set up a high-level group to discuss the potential and catastrophic possibilities of AI. Uh, where do the Chinese fit in on this? On the one hand, I've heard you say, and not only you, that we need to go all out to compete with the Chinese uh, for some of the reasons you just said, because there could be bad players uh, or bad intentions. But where is it appropriate to cooperate and why? Well, first place, the Chinese should be pretty worried about generative AI. Mm -hmm. And the reason is that they don't have um, free speech. And so what do you do when the system generates something that's not permitted in their country? Right. right? Who do you jail? Yeah. Right? The computer, the user, the developer, the training data. It's not at all obvious. Yeah. And the Chinese regulators so far have been relatively intelligent about this. But it's obvious if you think about it that the spread of these things will be highly restricted in China because it fundamentally addresses their information monopoly. Right. That makes sense. Right. So in our conversations with China, both Dr. Kissinger and I, when we were together, um, and unfortunately he passed away, and the subsequent meetings have been set up as a result of his inspiration to do them, everyone agrees that there's a problem. But we're, we're at the moment with China, we're speaking in generalities. There is not a proposal in front of either side mm -hmm. that's actionable, and that's okay, mm -hmm. because it's complicated. Mm -hmm. And a lot of this, because of the stakes involved, it's actually good to take your time to actually explain what you view as the problem. So many Western computer scientists are visiting with their Chinese counterparts and trying to say, if you allow this stuff to, to proliferate, you could end up with a terrorist act, right? the misuse of these for biological weapons, the misuse of these for cyber. Um, the the long-term worry is, is much more existential, but at the moment, I think the Chinese conversations are largely very constrained by, bio, by concerns about bio threats and, and uh, cyber threats. Right. The long-term threat goes something like this. At, uh, when I talk about AI, I talk about it as human-generated. Mm -hmm. So you or I give it at least in theory, a command. Mm -hmm. And you may, it may be a very long command, and it may be recursive in the sense, but it starts with a human judgment. Right. There is something technically called recursive self-improvement, right. where the model actually runs on its own, and it just learns and gets smarter and smarter. Right. When that occurs, or when agent-to-agent -agent interaction that's heterogeneous occurs, yeah. we have a very different set of threats which we're not ready to talk to anybody about because we don't understand them. <laughs> but they're coming. Do you see, I guess I'm trying to think about what a kind of dialogue with the Chinese could mean. Would it be something like nuclear proliferation? I mean, where if they understand the existential threat, to start at that level, maybe an IAEA type of thing for proliferation, do you think that's possible on, on the political horizon? It's going to be very difficult to get any actual treaties with China. Mm -hmm. um, what I'm engaged with is called a track two dialogue, right. which means that it's informal. It's not. It's it's educational. It's interesting. Right. 
It's very hard to predict by the time we get to real negotiations between the U.S. and China yeah. what the political situation will be, what the threat situation yeah. would be. A simple requirement would be that if you're going to do training for something that's completely new, mm -hmm. you have to tell the other side that you're doing it okay. so that you don't surprise them. So it's like the open skies during the Cold yeah. War. So, so an example would be a no surprises rule. When a missile is launched anywhere in the world, mm -hmm. all the countries acknowledge that they know it's coming. Right. That way they don't jump to a conclusion and think it's targeted at them. Right. That strikes me as a basic rule, right? Furthermore, that if you're doing powerful training, mm -hmm. there needs to be some agreements around safety. 